Excellencies, distinguished uh, participants, good morning, good morning. Uh, let us start now. I think uh, we are missing a few. I'm glad that we're having this uh, public forum today and not yesterday because we would have missed at least half of you yesterday. Uh, so welcome, good morning, and as we normally start, we will begin with uh, opening remarks from the Dean, uh, Professor Ek uh, Tangsaputana. Good morning and a warm welcome to all of you. I have uh, the pleasure of uh, opening today to uh, ISIS uh, public forum on ACS news, both people, crisis, regionalization, regulation, and uh, regionalism. In recent weeks, many thousands of both people originating from the Bay of Bengal in the vicinity of Bangladesh and Myanmar have faced face uh, danger and desperation on the high seas in their pursuit of jobs and better livelihoods. The fright and uh, preach of the new waves of both people have shed international spotlight on long-standing regional human struggling and uh, persecution and poverty of the hapless victims from the two countries concerned. However, as they have transit through the sought sanctuaries in Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, the both people crisis have been regionalized without an adequate regulatory framework to manage it. it. Tracing the origins of these both people, handling their sufferings at sea and finding longer term solution to their bridge uh, have posed regional challenges for the five main countries involved and for the international community more broadly. As you know, Thailand recently hosted a 17 country international meeting uh, to focus on ways forward. And Malaysia and Indonesia have made a promising start by agreeing to provide temporary shelter to the both people for up to one year in anticipation of third country resettlement or repatriation back to the home country. These steps in the right direction, but they are far short of what is needed for the region as a whole for and for the victims. This public forum is our small contribution to ongoing efforts to negative ways forward for the both people and for our increasingly borderless neighborhood. I would like to thank uh, each of the speakers for joining uh, us today. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Labovitz from International Organization for Migration, Bangkok. Uh, Kunkawi Jongkit Tawon, who is uh, a senior fellow uh, at ISIS here, and also a veteran journalist uh, with wide ranking think tank engagement. Uh, Ms. Quint Robinson, uh, who is also a senior fellow at ISIS here, and also a chief editor of uh, DKE ASEAN Review. Uh, Ajahn Kasila, chief pensuk from uh, Department of International Relations here at the Faculty of Political Science. And uh, many thanks to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Kasit Pilom, uh, former Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, of Thailand, and a senior leader 
of Democrat Party for joining the panel. Uh, without further ado, uh, let me return the floor to uh, Professor uh, Titinan. Thank you. Now, we have titled this forum in a very broad uh, fashion, Board People, and not just board people, but new, new board people. We've had a lot of board people around the region over the decades. These are new board people. We could call them Rohingya. A lot of people say that. We could call them asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, and so on. But uh, we're using this frame as a as a broad frame. Uh, new, new board people. And it's a crisis that uh, crosses borders, and it involves different countries. For the first time, it involves South Asia and Southeast Asia. And for Southeast Asia, it's the Western part of Southeast Asia. This is something that we haven't seen in the past as much. The Boat People crisis could be pitched, could be framed as a non-traditional security issue as well. So uh, many layers, many uh, dimensions of, uh, of the crisis that we want to, to tackle. There was a meeting that I think the, our speakers will discuss a little bit by, uh, hosted by Thailand. So I think out of that meeting, uh, a few outcomes were clear. They had a long statement and so on, and you know there was some uh, controversy, some commotion about uh, Myanmar and, and, and so on. Uh, a couple of outcomes were clear. First, Thailand established itself, I think, clearly that it is a, a tr transit country. So the issue of being a transit country was clear. Um, and then uh, the, uh, the term Rohingya was not used, uh, so I think Myanmar was happy about that. Uh, uh, Bangladesh, for the first time, Bangladesh received a lot of international focus. Normally, the boat people crisis, the, boat, the waves of boat people, um, the international media, the public perception have labeled them Rohingya. But I think the role of Bangladesh now is in the spotlight because Bangladesh equally shares responsibility as a source of the, the, the boat people. In fact, uh, recent interviews conducted in Indonesia, in, in Sumatra, uh, indicate that more than 60% of the board people arriving uh, in the Aceh area are in fact from Bangladesh. Uh, you know, so something for us to discuss. I want to thank all the panelists. Uh, uh, and, I'll, and I'll go one by one later on. To, uh, in particular, um, our IOM uh, colleague. I also want to thank my my um, senior fellows here, Gui Chongkitawan and, and uh, Gwen Robinson. I also want to recognize Peter Sherman, another new senior fellow at ISIS. Um, let us begin with IOM. So the International Organization for Migration deals with people, people that cross borders, people of different ethnic backgrounds and religions and, and um, economic standing and so on. Uh, and they've had uh, a, lot, a number of studies that I've actually looked at uh, on the sources, on the number, you know, the number of economic migrants from neighboring countries in Thailand, for example. That's a good paper. Um, but now, what what's next for us now after the meeting in Bangkok? Uh, the boat people crisis is not ending. Uh, Mr. Jeffrey Labovitz is the head of uh, IOM in in Bangkok. He's uh, worked on these migration issues for for a number of years. So please, uh, Mr. Labovitz, the floor is yours. Mr. Dean, Mr. Chair, Excellencies, fellow panelists, I'm very honored to be with such an esteemed group of people on such an interesting and stimulating topic. It's a topic which I'm going to be honest with you, I wouldn't have spoken about publicly one month ago. It's something which has been really difficult to talk about, and I think when we look at the May 29th meeting, that's one of the outcomes already, is that we're having a public, a more public discourse on some very, very difficult issues and bringing countries together to discuss things which we didn't discuss before. I didn't prepare a speech. I hope this is semi-Chatham House rules. And in one minute, I'm going to try to introduce where we are. It's not a new phenomena. It's a phenomena which has been going on for more than a decade, and departures have been tracked for almost 15 years. But it was something which was on a very low level with 1,000 or 2,000 people a year up until 2012. And in 2012, there was a lot of change in Myanmar. And with those changes also became a came a reinvigoration of this vote process. 
And when we had 2,000 people a year, and we had officially a help on policy for most of the countries, we suddenly had numbers which were exceeding seven, eight, nine, ten thousand people per month. In September of last year, which was the beginning of the sailing season, there were over 13,000 departures. And every month since then, there were, there were more than 7,000, which went down to 5,000 in April because of a crackdown. It would have exceeded those numbers again. And in that crackdown, it saw the rating of rubber tree plantation locations where smugglers, and I use the word smugglers, used camps to exact payments from individuals to go on to Malaysia. It's something which became very, very big. Part of what we're discussing is regionalization. That's part of the regionalization. For the people emanating from Northern Rakhine State, we've talked about the definitional problems. At times they're called Muslims from Northern Rakhine State, sometimes they're called Bengali, sometimes they're called irregular migrants, irregular Myanmar migrants, and they're self-declared as Rohingya. Even that is hard to say in any one issue because governments get angry. A half a million are in Saudi Arabia, 300,000 in the in the Emirates. In Bangladesh, there's estimates to 300,000 to 500,000. In Malaysia now, through this boat operation, there's 100,000 plus, perhaps 120, 130, 140,000 individuals. In Thailand, there's been numbers talked about 10,000. I don't think it's that high, but there's certainly some. And there's increasing numbers in smaller numbers of different locations, including India and Pakistan. So this is not an isolated issue, it's a broader regional issue. The numbers in Rakhine are estimated to be 1.2 million people. So there's far more outside than inside. So it's undeniable that there is a regional dimension and has been for a long time. It's just become more acute and more visual. Regulation, it's another topic. The numbers of Bangladeshis has changed, and changed from boat to boat, from year to year. It's a different dynamic. But certainly there are economic migrants who are coming from Bangladesh. Regulation is easier to address in some of those ways, with strong partnerships and dialogue. And also looking at legal frameworks for, for migration. There's been a long-standing labor migration trend, phenomena, between Bangladesh and Malaysia that's been legal. 10 years ago, in the biggest year ever, 270,000 individuals departed from Bangladesh to Malaysia in a legal way to go and work. Now that's diminished in recent years, I think it was five or 6,000 this past year, because there's been a more formulated regular agreement, government to government agreement, to look at plantation workers only. And so if we're looking at the phenomena and regulation, we could also look at legal means for a country which very much is looking for workers, where there's a rich tradition in sharing of labor. And we just have to come together and look at ways where it's beneficial to everyone. The boat operation is also it has a law enforcement element. There's no question about it. It went from 2,000 a year up to 13,000 in one month at its peak and seven to 8,000 a month for several, several months. People sat in cafes, in their houses, late at night, talking about how they were gonna get the money to pay to go on this trip to go to Malaysia. And they did so generally knowing the cost and the price and the procedure. It was fairly open. There were boats which were out on shores where people can go up to and speak to a person, a broker, to come and register. And now that's stopped. I believe the crackdown which is currently taking place means effectually that we're not going to see any boat departures for several months. There's no longer going to be boats that can host a thousand or two thousand individuals that sit offshore with small feeder boats, taking them to those bigger boats, and once they get filled up, they make the journey and come offshore before they can come and make a financial transaction before they go to the final destination. It's no longer unnoticed, it's too conspicuous. 
but we may see in four to six months, particularly after the sailing season starts again, of smaller boats making the attempt to try to do this journey, and we'll see how that happens. I don't think we're going to see the big numbers ever again. This is a part of also regional cooperation. With countries talking to each other, with poli making policies, and also doing law enforcement. But there also has to be mechanisms for protection. And lives have to come first. And the most disappointing part of this entire process, for me, has been seeing, knowing that people were sitting on boats out to sea without food, without being able to move, without being able to get up, without being beaten out of turn, and dying, with not a consolidated effort rapidly to get these people to shore. Now it's consolidated and it's happened, and we welcome that. But death is not an option. There's got to be safe processes which link into regulation. We had a conference on May 29th, and it was a conference which was called by the Thais to look at this very, very hard issue, and it brought people together in a way they have not been brought together before. And I've heard a lot of commentaries about the meeting. I was at the meeting, and it is a great success. And I'm not saying that to a group of people to be nice. I'm saying that because for the first time we had people sit around and talk about the very, very hard issues which is at the center of this boat operation. Now, nobody can expect that it's all going to be solved at one meeting on May 29th with 17 countries and a whole bunch of observers, and I think 500 accredited media is watching the first part of every word. But it is a success if we have a follow-up mechanism. And this is now the challenge. Because the follow-up mechanism at the meeting was not clearly defined. We talk about ASEAN mechanisms, and ASEAN mechanisms have not addressed the issue for the past decade and a half. But it can now, and people are watching, and we're convening together to talk about this. And the most important thing is a continued dialogue amongst partners to address the many issues associated with the spoke movement. Thank you. Mr. Lavovitz, let me just ask two quick follow-up questions. Uh, please describe for us uh, in some kind of vivid uh, detail about how this how does this work. So the this this work is in Bangladesh. They they would get in a small feeder boat, uh, and then they would go into the bigger boats. How 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 many of them? Uh, I've heard like 900 in one boat. And how long are they at sea? Um, how much do they pay? So that just, uh, just give us a, a sense of that, because we read about the boat people, we don't know how they actually you know, become the boat people. Um, please. I could talk about that really quickly. It's pretty well known at this point. Um, they, had, they had smaller boats which were arriving three to five to eight years ago. They were not the big boats, and it was only during a sailing season where there were departures, because it was too dangerous to go on the high seas. But approximately three years ago, when um, the boat operation exploded in numbers, it, it quadrupled. They started using bigger boats, uh, which would, could go year-round. And so it was no longer a seasonal phenomenon. So small boats, would there'd be recruiter boats and recruiters on the different shores of northern Rakhine State of Bangladesh. Um, and those, there would be fees which would be paid up front, usually very small, a couple hundred dollars. They'd go on the small boats to the larger boats. The larger boats would depart when they were filled. And I believe this is where we have some of the, the grossest forms of trafficking, where there were recruiters who were given quotas and trying to fill up boats in order that, that it could leave and they could start filling out the next one. And there were some people reportedly drugged or tricked and, uh, and others. And we have uh, cases of kidnapping which I think are, are verifiable and true. I don't think that's the larger phenomena. The boats themselves then could be over 1,000 people, 700, 800, 1,000. Um, you've seen the photos, they're indexed, there's limited freedom of movement. As soon as you started the journey, you were starving. There's not enough food to sustain a person on these boats. It's, it takes place of human cargo, and humans were treated as cargo and nothing else. 
The journey on a smaller boat could take two or three weeks. The journey on a larger boat would generally take a few weeks. Then they would go offshore, disembark, take them to camps, and go across the border. To give a few statistics, because we've been doing medical um, exams for uh, boat people for several years. So I've been working directly with these people for, for several years. And about 40% of the people that we've seen who were found through raids on rubber tree plantations or on roads going through Thailand or on boats disembarking, um, about 40% were malnourished. So they were, they were starting the starvation process. They're very, very thin. And you can see that on the images now. About 4% are severely malnourished. And severely malnourished is a technical term based on body mass index. And it's people who are risking death, but they're not there yet. And then we have about 1.9% who are severely, severely, and they have something which I call a textbook disease called beriberi, it's a thiamine deficiency, where they resemble skeletons, and they can no longer sustain their weight nor stand up, and often they cannot eat. And this is right before death. If you extrapolate those statistics, I'll make a couple guesses for people who are looking at this issue. My guesses are that if you take the very, very and the severely malnourished individuals, those are the people who are not making payments and were stuck longer periods of time in camps. For the latter part of the process, they did not get off camps, they stayed on boats and were processed there because it was several months where the crackdown was taking place. It wasn't only in April, it wasn't only in February, it was going on a lot prior to that, there was different methodologies. So those people who did not pay stayed longer, and those were the more severe medical cases, and so my guess is about four to five percent of the entire group were non-payers and the most vulnerable, and those who would have been subjected to extortion, rape, murder, um, and, and or trafficking. The truth is, when you're that ill, you're no longer a commodity, because they can't, you can't work. And this was a commodity process and a working process. A lot of those people would have died. Uh, we'll come back to you, and you mentioned key partners. We also want to come back to you later on to, to see who you think are the key partners here. Uh, but now let's move to Kun uh, The Thai government has made human trafficking a top priority. Uh, and I think that they, they are proud. This is uh, their way of uh, gaining international legitimacy and uh, uh, domestic standing, that they've tackled this issue head on. Uh, and even uh, Mr. Labovic has said that you know, this meeting on the 29th of May was a great success. Uh, so, Kun Kui, how would you assess the, the, the Thai position? And also, if you want to uh, t move into the ASEAN issue as well, that, that would be fine. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Titinan. Uh, this is a very a uh, difficult subject because uh, when you ask uh, what's next, there would be more meeting, of course. <laughs> and I think there should be much more higher level because the senior official level, they just talk, they are not policy. So next time they should be much higher so that certain policy, certain mechanisms that uh, Jeffy uh, was referring to. I, I will focus on the Thai side because I think uh, Thailand is a key country. Thailand is a frontline state for all this year, for asylum seeker, for anybody, you know, for good or for worse. I think Thailand, uh, uh, since 29th, uh, has done a good job. Actually, it could have done better if our foreign minister talked to the media. Uh, somehow, I think he missed that, that part. And uh, you can see uh, the evolution of this issue. And you should be pleased that a country like Myanmar, even Bangladesh came out. You remember the time when a uh, couple of years back in 2009, because it was here, uh, issues of Rohingyas or this irregular uh, migrant was considered internal problem, no talk at all. And then suddenly the mood shift to the second stage is the internal problem with regional implication. This is what Malaysia, this is what Indonesia uh, had. Uh, focus on. Then Bangkok meeting. Bangkok meeting, you have to give credits to Thailand because Thailand viewed the issue as a regional issue with regional implications. And that's why Myanmar actually uh, came around. Because if Indonesia used the kind of uh, approach saying that it's the internal with regional, Myanmar would not come. I think the next step which uh, Jeffrey had mentioned is that it will reach the regionalization with international sort of uh, 
impact, you know, because as you said, uh, Lohinia is, uh, is not only limited to country in Southeast Asia, half a million is in the uh, country like Saudi Arabia and pocket of them in India, Pakistan. So with this kinds of uh, sense of participation increasingly, I think this is very good. And the Thai has done a good job in facilitating. Thailand has not yet done much because thanks to other layers of problems, you, you have to understand that why Thailand has come this far. Um, the Thai government said we have adopted zero torrent on human trafficking. Actually, there's no such a notion of zero uh, torrent because you know Thailand now is under military regimes. You know they can use whatever. Even with this kind of authorities, Thailand still could not change the thing that they want to change. But somehow we have to give credits to this government because they have done a lot of changes. But this change, whether it will affect tip reports or not, I don't know. You have to wait until 23rd of this month if John Kerry is well enough to make announcement. That's it. This is very interesting. Because of tip report, that led to the most amazing law enforcement prosecution of Thai officer at all level, bringing incredible changes to legislations, to, for example, to Fishery Act, to labor management. These are the things that I must admit it's come from the external factors, the tip reports, the EU pressure. But this government use it as an instrument to bring about change. Thailand, uh, as you know, through our history, we have a very, what do you call, clever way to use external pressure for internal change. In fact, that has been almost in every major uh, re reform in Thailand. This is also uh, one of the case. I have to mention tip reports. I have to mention IUU because without this, I don't think the government will act this dramatically. And you have to keep credits to to have a be behind it. And I, I think uh, Payut, uh, he has driven all the Thai officials uh, up the walls because he very uh, uh, passionate on, on, on this issue. So you can see on the issues of uh, law, enforcement very, very important. Uh, and the changes of the labor system very important. Now I think hopefully, hopefully this will be the beginning of a durable uh, solution because you want to solve the uh, illegal migrants. You have to make sure that the labor will come to your country is well treated. Now there are about 50,000 something uh, uh, Myanmar uh, workers that has been registered. In fact, in recent weeks, uh, more workers from Cambodia has been registered, not Myanmar, which has, uh, surprised me. Um, if you give them good treatment, from now on, the Thai said that those registered will receive the same right, get 300 baht, you know, all this uh, whatever welfare, which is good. That, I think, is the best way to handle the so-called irregular migrants, or whatever it is. And I think Thailand now is moving into direction. It's going to take time. It's going to cost money. And now you just see the beginning, because the registration of uh, uh, migrant worker just started. There's still a lot of problems. Now the Thai government uh, has already come out with regulations that uh, those who live across the border can come in, have pay 100 baht for border pass because they're going to set up economic zone. That kind of thing is very good. So two things that I would give credit that Thailand has contributed to this. That is law enforcement. Serious. I hope law enforcement is not only on human trafficking. It's on other things, corruption and all these things. And I think this government has arrested uniform officers, you know, both green and khaki, which is very good. They should have done more. I think it's a little bit too little, you know. Now it's over 100 now. So that's... Um, that's very good. Number two, the reason why the Thai gives so much report, I think Dr. Titinan said it right. We want to gain a legitimacy. But now that legitimacy is not come easy. Thailand now is waiting. Prime Minister last week came out that hopefully we'll get a better upgrade evaluation from the TIP report. I don't think so. I think Thailand uh, might not 
get a better evaluation. But if not, Thai-U.S. relations will be in decline because I think our development in the past few weeks has been very encouraging. But you can see some of the Thai style uh, engaging with the American. The American said in surveillance pains, the Thai said, wait a minute, you know, we are no longer the kind of friends 182 years old. We should have given you right away access to our uh, air zone, but you just wait for a few more days. So if the relation were good, I think America should be able to do surveillance and station the aircraft here, but now they cannot. Uh, they can only uh, fly a surveillance flight with Thai uh, uh, Air Force officer two or three at certain time and return to Subang and the permission will end uh, this weekend so there will be no more as I think uh, Jeffrey mentioned it correctly that uh, the uh, the influx has stopped because of also the monsoon rain so the tip report also encouraged the Thai to call on this meeting to show that we are willing, we are facilitating, we are coordinating country. So I think the next move is to make sure that the, all the big guys, you know, 17 countries or the donor money that coming in is not enough and Thailand no. And the other thing is that now Thailand is more coordinated among all the seven ministries and agency that come out with a common approach to this problem. So I think that will be good. and I. If international community use this opportunity to work on build up a better mechanism, I think this human trafficking business uh, will be at least partially tackled in the most uh, 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 correct way. And I hope that Myanmar, Myanmar is a very interesting case because Myanmar is now getting confidence that they would be able to talk about this issue, even, I mean, of course, they are very sensitive using Rohingya, they would be able to touch on the issue uh, indirectly, but the fact that they admitted that uh, uh, part of the problems, Bangladesh and uh, uh, Myanmar as a source of origin is a very good starting point, and I think uh, international community will work on it. I think this confidence will increase when uh, more and more dialogue. In fact, Myanmar has uh, conducted briefing very seriously, of, I think twice with uh, uh, diplomats and other international community to create a kind of uh, uh, explanation and understand of the, of the situation. And I think that's uh, very important. Now, the next step, Thailand will certainly push this in the ASEAN agenda, particularly uh, as an issue on transnational crimes. Because within ASEAN, this issue uh, is very sensitive. It cannot be discussed. Uh, in the year 2012, when it was uh, discussed in the retreat indirectly, the issue was high behind the human rights violations uh, or to protect the uh, human rights of women and children is not on the international issue as, for example, uh, human trafficking. So I think this kind of ASEAN way of tackling the issue incrementally will have to take place. And I think Malaysia will also take the lead. Now, whether the, Malaysia take the lead or not will depends on Najib own political uh, uh, bargaining power within. You don't want to champion something if you are really weak, you know. So I hope that uh, Najib at the moment will put this into agenda as champion because Thailand, Indonesia, and Singapore, uh, including Brunei, will support it as an ASEAN agenda. Attempt to do that in the past failed. There was an attempt in October 2012 under the chairmanship of Cambodia to organize a special foreign minister meeting on Rohingya, but it was completely rejected by Myanmar. So Myanmar attitude at the moment was very good. And I think you, we, in the national community, should uh, nurture that. And ASEAN should also take the lead. Now, whether ASEAN will have that mechanism or not, they don't have that because this issue essentially, as I said, the evolution, internal problem, no talk, internal with regional talk a little bit, regional with regional implication talk a little bit better. Now, just like South China Sea at one time, very 
uh, focus, bilateral, regionalized, and international. I think this is a very good start. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kinkawi. <clears throat> You've touched on a range of issues that we'll come, come back to. Uh, ASEAN, of course, Thailand, Malaysia as chair of ASEAN. And now let us move uh, and focus a little bit on, on Myanmar. Uh, Gwen Robinson has been working on a book project on Myanmar, spent a lot of research time in Tibukain State, in Sikwe especially. Uh, and as you know, I find it very interesting that some people, they want, they call Myanmar Burma, and they want to talk to the Burma, uh, the Burmese government, about the Rohingya problem. Uh, that doesn't go very far in Myanmar. Uh, this is a deeply ingrained um, sentiment issue in, in the Myanmar uh, psyche, if you will. So perhaps uh, you could share some light and uh, elaborate a little bit on the, uh, the Myanmar position uh, in addition to the other dynamics, uh, Gwen. Thanks, Dr. Tijinan. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, as uh, Dr. Tijinan said, I, I, I wear two hats. Uh, one is as a broadly uh, media, um, mainly on analysis and uh, research, um, and uh, also as an academic, more academic kind of researcher working on books. Uh, but as media, I've been to Rakhine State and, and uh, some of the big camps housing Rohingya or Bengalis as they're known locally uh, several times. I've interviewed people on both sides, but I've also been to other places like Mektila in uh, central Myanmar, where we saw shocking violence in 2013 people killed, uh, displaced, um, mosques torched, then that was broadly anti-Muslim, nothing to do with Rohingya. So um, this issue is hugely complex in, on the ground in Myanmar. Um, as a member of ISIS and uh, from a more um, uh, research approach, I've looked at the international and economic dimensions of um, the crisis, particularly the recent, uh, the recent uh, issues we've seen um, uh, concerning the boat people. I'd say that there are at least um, two really clear issues that emerge from all of this, and one is the international regional uh, diplomatic issues and uh, the, the challenge to not just uh, the entire region, but ASEAN in particular. I think the new boat people crisis, if you like to call it that generally, is probably the biggest diplomatic challenge uh, for the region and particularly ASEAN. Um, no matter where these people come from, as Jeff Lebowitz pointed out, um, there's a big and growing international dimension from Pakistan and India. But I think ASEAN is at the heart of all this and is facing its own kind of internal crisis as a result. Um, the, Re the Rohingya crisis per se um, is really focusing on the treatment of a particular stateless people in Myanmar and also the government's refusal to recognize them. That's almost in a way a separate, um, although intrinsic part of this uh, broader issue. Associated with this, the issues of identification and bl is the blame game that's coming. Where they're from, the contention that as many as, well, we've just heard 50% or even 60% on recent votes could be from Bangladesh uh, and therefore economic migrants, therefore in a different category, uh, in fact, I think uh, the proportions differ with every boatload, particularly when we're looking at boats for 1,000 people or more. In fact, uh, the latest 900 rescued or some say located and detained by Myanmar Navy um, uh, of 900, 150 of them were agreed by both sides, Bangladesh and Myanmar, to um, be economic migrants who will be sent back to Bangladesh. Um, but there's no clear formula for these proportions. We've just heard um, from uh, um, uh, UN that some figures uh, suggest five years ago there are almost no Bangladeshis in this stream that has been coming out of Myanmar for some years, actually, of boat people. A few years ago, that was 20%. More recently, as I just said, 50 to 60%. These proportions and what we're seeing on every boatload, I think, depends entirely on which trafficking network, who the traffickers are that are running that boat, um, how they're marketing their, 
their passages, uh, where they're selling, what people they're preying on. So um, I think that, that really further complicates the issue. And uh, sometimes the two issues, the economic migrants and um, the um, stateless, greatly perpers- persecuted Rohingya, Bengalis, whatever you call them, are, um, are very um, different in some respects. But in the end, they are all boat people in crises and need humanitarian um, attention. I'd just like to turn to the international diplomatic aspect before I come back to Myanmar, and I'll try and keep myself short. Um, Yes, as uh, Jeff noted, the fact um, that the May 29th meeting in Bangkok took place was uh, in itself a huge success, um, though any real measure of success, as he added, rests on the overall follow-up. Personally, I, I think having covered ASEAN for uh, many years or decades, um, this could be a a really a defining crisis for ASEAN because it's brought to the fore long-running divisions and tensions between allies who actually were held in by these great principles of non-interference in each other's affairs. You don't comment on religion or society or their own uh, own policies uh, affecting their domestic uh, populations. Uh, now it's all out in the open. Um, these issues which have been quite kept quiet and largely internal up to now over religion, security, social issues, even migration policies. Um, so these, these former long-standing principles of ASEAN are kind of fragmenting or at least metamorphizing. And uh, now we're seeing this unprecedented finger pointing and uh, maneuvering over identification of people, buck passing. Um, you know, I, I do agree, though, the fact they could get into a room and talk things through, even with Bangladesh, Australia, um, other countries, is a, is a very good sign. Um, but we've all, we've seen divisions um, over other things, like internally, um, related to religion, geography, political. So we've seen Malaysia and Indonesia ganging up, in a sense, on Myanmar, or even in recent cases on Thailand. Uh, many blaming Myanmar in efforts to deflect blame from themselves uh, for uh, the continuing stream of boat people and other configurations uh, with uh, the good guys like the Philippines coming in to offer to take some of these people. So that's really one to watch, I think, is the nature of what this crisis becomes as a diplomatic issue, how it could redefine some of the ways ASEAN countries are relating to each other. In a year, it should be added, that is supposed to be about economic integration, the great ASEAN economic community, connectivity, open borders. And um, I've already heard that the Thai-Malaysian border has suffered as a result with um, some of the markets along the border and uh, security being tightened as a result. Um, Further complicating the involvement, of course, are other players such as Bangladesh going around saying all these migrants are sick people anyway and Australia going around saying that uh, every country has a sovereign right to push boatloads of people back out to sea, so that's not very helpful. Um, In the new ASEAN economic community, I think it's sowing division, just as as this region is uh, trying to cooperate um, and integrate on the economic front. But the big elephant hanging over uh, some of these countries, of course, is, as Kelly mentioned, the TIP report, the Trafficking in Persons Annual ranking by the US State Department, uh, which brings with it certain sanctions sanctions and um, censure, not just, and this is not just about Thailand and the Thai efforts to uh, ward off a, a downgrading or a, a rock bottom grading for a second consent consecutive year, which would in itself bring sanctions uh, of various sorts, um, but also For example, see how US Congress just recently has succeeded in introducing a clause to legislation on the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. And you're really getting to see a much broader dimension of this trafficking issue than um, one would ever have envisaged. Um, Under this clause, (coughs) uh, countries with bad human trafficking records would actually be banned from fast-track trade deals with the US. And uh, that, of course, would uh, be severely affect Malaysia, which is one of the few Southeast Asian countries that's actually really trying to sign up for the TPP. It would be ineligible if it was uh, downgraded to the bottom tier. Um, so just turning very quickly to Myanmar, um, 
I think uh, one dimension I think that is possibly missed or, or in the broader international context maybe is not such a, such a big issue to other countries is um, the crucial, crucial um, national election coming up at the end of the year. Um, it's the first free, supposedly free, full national election. It's uh, ushering in an entire new regime, um, it's, it's thought, and uh, with that, uh, the consolidation in a way of a lot of the reforms and opening that Myanmar struggled so hard uh, to achieve in the last uh, few years. So cannot overemphasize the importance of this poll, but with the prospect of that election, um, the boat people crisis, the international uproar over Rohingya, Bengali, um, the, the blaming and the finger pointing at Myanmar is both disruptive and disrupting with, um, with huge domestic political impact. And I think it's both uh, the, uh, Myanmar's domestic political circumstances are both a cause and effect behind the escalation of this issue. Uh, in fact, uh, the domestic politics right now in Myanmar almost ensures that we will not see any significant action out of the government or anyone remotely uh, with political aspirations and that includes Aung San Suu Kyi, the one voice in Myanmar that might have had some moral authority to speak out and comment has been conspicuously silent and President Thein Sein uh, may or may not put himself up again for re-election, but even if he does not, he is a key member of the ruling party of Myanmar and obviously very mindful of upsetting a 75 to 80% majority Burman population who broadly, and it can be said broadly, um, totally rejects the notion that Rohingya or Bengali have any place in the country whatsoever and in any suggestion of a referendum would completely, would totally reject any notion of giving citizenship to these people um, and would therefore, I mean, I think the domestic situation would seriously block any of these proposals to start some kind of citizenship, proper citizenship program, even though that is an ideal that was enshrined in Myanmar's Rakhine Commission report a couple of years ago. Anyway, um, by that to same token, I think the issue is also helping to actually weigh on and slow up some of the reforms inside Myanmar politically, uh, in particular with rallies we're now seeing inside uh, Yangon and also uh, much more hostility in Rakhine State. The backlash with all this international pressure, of course, is, is on the people themselves, the Rohingya, who become even more vilified, uh, vilified figures uh, given that you know the the domestic audience in the country is seeing that because of this issue they are being crucified internationally they are suffering their image problem because of this so uh, I don't think um, I don't think that the international community should should have very high expectations that bullying pressure cajoling even you know offering incentives to Myanmar to get some serious action on citizenship and things like that are um, really very realistic in this year, maybe under a new regime, particularly if it's dominated by reformers, um, but uh, that remains to be seen. And on that note, I will um, pass over to Kun Kassir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Quinn. Um, you have the bios of the speakers uh, handed out to you, so I'm not going to go into the background, but in fact, uh, uh, Gwen is a veteran journalist, uh, probably uh, like Kim Kui in many ways, but she's probably one of the top five journalists in the world uh, who happens to be based in Thailand uh, with uh, experiences in all kinds of uh, issues and in different continents. So thank you very much. You introduced uh, something that we must bear in mind, domestic politics. Uh, in the election year in Myanmar, it's going to be very difficult. The situation will not be better in Myanmar. In Rakhine, the situation will be worse in an election year. Uh, in normal year, it's already bad enough. Uh, so that's something we have to think about. Sensitivity is also in Thailand. Uh, in Bangladesh, I'm not as sure about. I, I don't know. I've been reading the, some of the Bangla Bangladeshi media, and it's politicized. Uh, Sheikh Hasina has recently chastised the vote people for leaving Bangladesh uh, and uh, tainting Bangladesh's image uh, abroad. That's what she said. Uh, so domestic political sensitivity is also very much uh, at play.